places. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for this evening, and Lord, we thank you that we can gather together and consider uh, the truth of your word, and Lord, we just ask that you would have free course to do all you want to do this evening. Um, help me to communicate, even though I have a, a tired brain, um, and we do uh, pray for our, our sister Vanessa in South Africa, that you would bless her time there, that it would be a fruitful time. And, Lord, that she would come back encouraged in you, just seeing uh, your hand upon her life. And uh, we thank you for Mathetes and everything that you're doing through all the classes and in everyone's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so um, a little recap, right? Okay, so uh, made, God spoke creation into existence, including our world and people like me and you, uh, and humans set apart in God's creation as being the only created beings made in the image in the likeness of God. But then, mutiny. Adam and Eve were created in perfection, and they were living in perfection in the garden, um, but when they were created, they were created with the ability to choose, freedom of the will. They could choose to obey God. They could choose to disobey God. And we know that they chose. They chose to disobey God, which is called the fall. Falling from holiness to sinfulness. And we noted that, that all of creation has been impacted, subject to sin, leading to degradation, darkness, death, all those not good things that we read about in the news, right? But God has a mission, yeah? Being omniscient, being all-knowing, he knew that humanity would fall even before he created creation. And so knowing this, God had a plan to redeem his creation from the ravages of sin. And that plan involved himself. That Jesus, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, that he would come and take upon himself perfect humanity. That he would give his life as that perfect sacrifice for sin. Yours and mine, everybody's. Making salvation available to everyone who's willing to turn from their sin and embrace Jesus as the Savior. And, and just setting in motion yeah, um, what's going to culminate in the redemption of all of creation, which we're looking forward to. Right? Yes. We're excited about it. Maybe. Okay, all right. All right, this evening we move on to war. Behind the scenes of the physical world that you and I live in, there is what we would call the spiritual realm. And as God's mission of redemption is being worked out, there is a war that is raging behind the physical reality of what we see, although it can have physical um, results. A war between forces of good and forces of evil. Those who are actively seeking to move God's plan of redemption forward, angels, and those who are actively seeking to oppose God's mission of redemption, even trying to bring a reversal to it, and that's what we would call demons. So allies, adversaries, and we, we begin with our allies, and you will notice that I have used a lot of old paintings. Um, for one, um, they're in the public domain, so that helps me. Two, they're, many of them are, are just amazing, really, um, to consider that someone painted that by hand, right? Um, and so many of the presentations are not, I mean, that's not exactly what an angel looks like as far as we know, okay? So, but you get the idea, okay? So, our allies, angels, 
They are called ministering spirits. The writer of Hebrews asks concerning angels, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? And so, angels have been tasked with a ministry, and that is to humans, and specifically to those who will be redeemed or are redeemed, okay? Um, angels are, are recorded as being actively at work on behalf of God's plans and his people in both the Old Testament and the New. Um, Lot was warned of Sodom's destruction and saved from its destruction by angels. Elisha, not Elijah, but Elisha, um, him and his servant, uh, they were protected from the Syrian army. Um, and you may recall that, that they saw the angels as, uh, you know, chariots of fire, right? Okay. Um, Daniel. What, what do you guys need? We have no idea how it's spelled. Elisha, E L I S H A. Elisha. Okay. Yeah, feel free to ask me. I'm right here. They appeared as chariots of fire and horses. Yeah. Um, Daniel. Daniel was, he was strengthened by an angel on more than one occasion that had been sent to him um, in response to his prayers. Uh, the angel Gabriel uh, told Zach, Zacharias, his wife Elizabeth, Elizabeth would bear John, who would become John the Baptist, who would announce the coming of Jesus. Gabriel also told Mary that she had been chosen to bear Jesus. Joseph was encouraged in a dream in which an angel, not named specifically, uh, to him to take Mary to be his wife, assuring him she had not been unfaithful, but this was God's plan for her to bear the Son of God. Jesus was ministered to by angels during his temptation in the wilderness, 40 days. Um, <clears throat> angels uh, also told the female disciples, some of them, the three Marys, of Jesus' resurrection. And the, the apostles were rescued from prison by an angel. Peter was rescued from prison by an angel. And Paul was comforted by an angel. And um, as we go on, we'll look at some of those a little bit more closely. Okay? So, uh, angels are messengers. Both the Old Testament word and the Greek word, are which are translated as angel, they mean messenger. And so we understand that these, these spiritual beings are, are beings that God uses at times to convey messages to humans. They do other things, but they're primarily messengers. It, it doesn't mean that God has to use them or that God is dependent upon them. He, he can communicate to humans without angels, but he chooses to do so. One of the things that we need to highlight is that they are not mediators. Yeah. They, they deliver messages, that is true, but they're, they're never um, described as being beings or, yeah, creatures that we would pray to or try to um, have them mediate between us and God. 
Okay? They're, they're, we're never encouraged to do that. The, that mediation, yeah. and neither can they um, you know, make any sacrifice um, like Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is our, our one and only mediator okay. in that sense. 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Okay? So we have to be careful with angels, and we'll we'll see that as we go on. Okay, other names for angels, they, they are called the sons of God in the book of Job. They are called holy ones in the Psalms. And then watchers in the book of Daniel. Oh, we're making pretty good time. I don't know. Maybe we'll see. Okay. So, <laughs> what are they like? What are they like? Okay, what are their characteristics? Well, the first thing that we need to know, we start at the beginning, is they are created. They are created beings. Colossians 1.16, we're going to go back to this verse a few times. It says, For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, speaking him being Jesus. Okay, so they fit in that category of being principalities and powers in there. When were they created? Well, they were created before the creation of the earth. And they were present at the earth's founding. We find that out in the book of Job. The, the Lord speaking to Job said, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. When the morning stars, that's speaking of the angels, sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay. All right, so created beings created before the foundation of the earth. Why were they created? Well, they were created to know God and fulfill his purposes and ultimately for his glory, for God's glory. Back to Colossians 1.16. At the, the end of the verse there, it says, All things were created through him and for him. Okay, so created by Jesus, but for Jesus. His purposes, his will, his desires, his glory. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're in the works somewhere. We're not, we're not given the, the breakdown of, of when they were created um, in, the, in the book of Genesis. But from Job, we understand that before the earth is formed, they're formed. You know, was it a couple minutes before? Was it a long, long time before? It was before. I don't know. Yeah, we're not told. Um, Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Okay, so all things give glory to God. Because it is by his honor, his power, that they were created and they exist. So angels were created for the glory of God. Okay. Unlike us, they were not created in the image of God. They were not given a choice to repent if they chose to obey. And although they are currently being, you know, they're currently seen as being higher than humans because of their present position. 
they are eventually going to be judged by redeemed humanity. So, currently seen as being higher, but they're going to be judged. 1 Corinthians 6.3 says, Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How is that going to play out? I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. It'll be good. <clears throat> okay, so they are created beings for the glory of God, and they are also spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, they do not have to maintain a physical form. Although they are finite in their being, they're not infinite. They are finite. And being spirits, they're invisible by nature. Spirits are invisible. But they can appear, the next blank that you're missing is visible form. Although they are spirits, they can appear visibly, even in human form. The scriptures record angels appearing as males in male clothing, although they do not seem to have gender like humans, but they always appear as male. They are immortal beings that, that do not marry as humans do. Jesus said that angels aren't given in marriage. Okay, so created, for God's glory, they're spiritual, they are intelligent. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, although finite, limited, angels are described as being intelligent, um, expressing emotion, uh, they are, they're rational, um, and their, their understanding and their knowledge is further heightened because they have, of their position. They have the advantage of being in the presence of God. Also, longevity. Because they've been around from the beginning. So they have the benefit of having seen everything play out from the beginning until now. And they probably have a, a pretty good um, take on different personalities of people and stuff like that. Because, I mean, they've, they've been watching people from the beginning. Yeah. So, like, oh, Timothy, I know his type. I, yeah, I know, what he's, I know what he's like. Yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> they are also holy beings, meaning that they are pure, they are without sin, and they can dwell in the very presence of God. They're also powerful. Uh, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. That's recorded in the book of Isaiah. Okay. One angel. So 186 or 85,000 to one. At least. <laughs> yeah. I'll take the angel. Yeah. Okay. Um, also in our, in our description in Colossians, uh, there is, there is a, a, an order and rank. We see that in, that in that phrase there, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And we, we get, um, or we have some details about some of the ranking, but very little. Okay? The first one is Michael, the archangel. Archangel means first in rank or in power. And Michael is specifically named 
as an archangel. His name means who is like God. He's also called one of the chief princes in Daniel 10.13, which may imply if he's one of the chief princes, that may mean that there's more than one archangel, possibly. And Michael is a, is a leader of an angelic army that is going to defeat Satan. And that's what these, these paintings are of. Are, um, that's Michael. Um, and there's Satan as a dragon is being crushed. Yeah. He's portrayed as a he, but a lot of these old paintings, they, it's, it's hard, to, hard to tell. Yeah. Hard to tell. It's just the, the style of the time. <laughs> Revelation 12. Now war rose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, speaking of Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought back. So there's a war. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Okay. So, Michael is the leader of an angelic army that's going to defeat Satan. All right. So, Michael the archangel. The next angel that we're, we're given a name for is Gabriel. And he's a, he's a, a prominent angel, um, although he may not be an archangel. He's not said to be, but he is prominent. And his name means hero of God. And he's, he's an important messenger. He, he took messages to Daniel, to Zacharias, and in this painting here, to Mary. Yeah. Giving them important messages. Okay. <clears throat> How are we doing? Um... Those are the only angels that we have names for, like individual names. The other ones are um, groupings or classes of angelic beings, okay? The first one are seraphim, S-E-R-A-P-H-I-M, S E R A. P-H-I-M, okay? They are, they're called heavenly beings in the scriptures. They're not specifically called angels, but they're grouped in that category. They're heavenly beings. Their name means burning ones, so it implies holiness in their name. They surround the throne of God, and they each have six wings, And they are, they're mentioned in the book of Isaiah only. And they are there, continually worshiping God, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Yeah. So, seraphim, six-winged angelic beings. Okay, this is, okay, is this weird? I, well... Maybe not in the spiritual realm. I, you know, for us, it's kind of hard to grasp these things. Well, yeah, they're worshiping. Yeah, they're worshiping God. Yeah. Okay. The next group are called cherubim. C-H-E-R-U-B-I-M. C-H-E-R. U-B-I-M, cherubim. They're also heavenly beings. 
And their, their name comes from um, the idea to, to cut or to engrave. And so it, it um, conveys the idea of like the engraving on a coin that represents someone. In this case, the late queen. Okay? Um, F.C. Jennings wrote, The cherubim we gather from the word itself was to be the representative of God. As the image cut on a coin represents fully the sovereign or governor that, it, that issues it. So that coin made to look like Queen Elizabeth II, the cherubim reflecting the image of God. Okay? Um, they also surround the throne. And each of them have four faces. A man, a lion, an ox... And an eagle. Okay. And interestingly, um, you can kind of correlate those to the four Gospels, but that's a whole other story. Okay. They have two pairs of wings. They have legs like men, but with calves' feet. Okay. Remember, once again, once again this, some of this could be symbolic, not necessarily literal, but there you go. Okay. The cherubim are seen as being... Defenders of God's holiness. Um, they, there were, were figures of cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. Overlooking the mercy seat. So they're like protecting the mercy seat. Yeah. And they were also um, protecting uh, in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, in the temp temple. Big cherubim, okay? And then cherubim also were placed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned. So they're guardians of God's holiness. So seraphim, Cherubim. And then we have one that's really easy for you to spell. Living creatures. <laughs> okay. And they may be a certain class of cherubim or seraphim, but they have they have they're described as having six wings like seraphim. Uh, cherubim have four, but then they're also described as having being full of eyes. Is that symbolic? Is that literal? Okay. I lean more towards the symbolic on that one, but hey. And they also surround the throne of God. They're described in Revelation chapter four. How many angelic beings? Are there? Anybody know? Two thousand four hundred and twenty-six. No. Okay. So, Revelation five eleven. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. So. So what number do you think that is? <laughs> That's a lot. That's, yeah. An innumerable number, okay? All right. Okay, so those are the different classes or groupings and Michael and Gabriel. Okay, well, what do they do? Well, they... They minister to believers. Um, generally, um, it says they may even visit us at times. Hebrews 1.14, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Then later in the book of Hebrews, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. So angels that look like people, 
that show up at your door who are not Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? <laughs> yeah, they're not. Okay, they, those, they're not angels, okay. Yeah, Philip. <laughs> I think you can answer that question. <laughs> okay, now, so they, they minister in a general sense, but then they also, as we, we've seen, they, they, they communicate. They communicate messages. They deliver messages of God's truth to believers. We mentioned a few of those things above already. Um, and then um, they, they serve in a protecting way where uh, Daniel, when he was in the lion's den, he specifically says that an angel protected him from the hungry lions. Uh, Peter, his release from prison, he would have been put to death, but he was released by an angel. Before that, the, uh, all the apostles had been released by an angel from prison. And so they, they protect believers at times. Okay. All right, so does this mean that there are guardian angels? Okay. The ancient Greeks... Babylonians and Jews also believed in guardian angel type beings. Um, then uh, in later history, um, a belief arose that, that each person was assigned an angel and a demon. Yeah. That's why in those, I don't know if you've seen those old cartoons where someone's, you know, they've got this little angel on one side and they're like, no, 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 do that. And then they got the devil on this side. Hey, you better do, you know. That's what that comes from. It's an ancient thing, okay? But do we have guardian angels? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you, so, you do. So, so like, like Shasha, and Abinadol. Yeah. So they were trained at places in the land, but then subsequently we saw Oh, no, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were placed in the fiery furnace. Yeah, and one like the Son of Man appeared with them, and that most likely was a, a pre-incarnate revelation of Jesus. That was probably Jesus. Yeah, it could have been an angel, but it was probably Jesus. Yep. So it, it, like I said, the Jews they had this, they had this idea. Yep. Okay. All right. There's one scripture that maybe we have guardian angels. Okay. So Matthew eighteen ten, it's Jesus speaking. He says, "See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven." That's all we've got, people, okay? So, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's great if we do. No, that that was just a a belief. Yeah, read the, we can talk about it later. (laughs) Yeah, she's just saying that she thinks it's, or they, they think it's Peter's angel. And that goes back to the traditional belief that, of this thing, okay? All right. That's fine. M- maybe we do. I mean, ultimately, we have God as our guardian, so. Yeah. Psalms 91, Where he talks about uh, the angels to be around us. He camps around those. Is that the one? Oh, because you're reading Hungarian. Yeah. Let's see. What's what's the what's the verse again? Ninety-one eleven. Ninety-one eleven. Okay. Take that one too. Psalm ninety-one eleven. Okay. But that but that doesn't. That's not saying a a guardian angel. That's talking about angels guarding God's people, 
but not in the specific of like you're assigned a guardian angel. That's I I don't I don't dispute that God does use angels to protect us at times. I'm speaking more about you know Philip everywhere he goes. His angels with him, right? That's what that's what I mean by a guardian. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay. So we'll find out. Okay. All right. They they also provide direction. Okay, directing. Philip, not the one here, um, he was directed by an angel in the book of Acts. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down to, from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Okay? So, directing is number four, where there's a four. And then Philip was given instructions by an angel. And then Cornelius was directed by an angel in a dream to send for Peter. It tells us that Cornelius was praying, and in the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. Okay, so specific instructions by this angel that appeared to Cornelius in a vision. Okay, um, we need to, to highlight a warning concerning receiving direction from angels. And that warning is found in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one preached to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. So we have to be careful about messages that come from angels. Because as we will see, there's bad ones. Yeah? Islam is founded upon revelations from an angel given to Muhammad. Mormonism is founded upon an angel giving a revelation to Joseph Smith. And, there, and you know, there's, there's people in Christian circles that, you know, they have, they've had encounters with angels, and the angels say things that are totally contrary to God's word, the truth. And so we're like, oh, no, no, thank you. I'll pass. Why? 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He knows how to make himself look really good. And to say things that sound really good. So we have to be really careful. we got to measure it by God's word. Okay? So they can give direction. We just need to be careful about that direction. Okay? Right. They also bring comfort, comforting believers in the midst of danger or trial. You may recall that, that Paul was on a ship that got caught in a storm for, oh man, a long time. It's like 10 days or more. I can't remember. Um, they're getting tossed to and fro, and Paul lets them know that an angel showed up to tell them that everything's going to be okay. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So Paul received comfort from this angel that everything's going to be okay. Right? Another thing that they do is they, they escort, yeah, most likely. Most likely, caring for believers at their time of death and escorting them into God's presence. Jesus uh, talked about this poor man. Um, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Okay, okay so that's their, 
their ministry towards believers. Um, what's their ministry towards unbelievers? Well, it's, we don't want to be on that side. <laughs> okay. So the word you can put in there, re- reproving unbelievers, reproving, R-E-P-R-O-V-I-N-G. Is it there? Okay, good. Okay. Um, announcing impending judgments. They let people know judgment is coming. Revelation 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an, with an internal, <laughs> eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's yet to come. Okay. They also inflict judgment on the unrighteous. Acts chapter 12, it's talking about Herod. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seal, seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately an angel st- of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. What a way to go. Okay. Um, they also separate the unrighteous from the righteous. Matthew 13. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not good. Okay. They are also... Active among the nations. Because there's an order and a ranking, they're, they're, they may be assigned to different regions. Okay? And we, we get some understanding of this in the book of Daniel. So an angel came to Daniel, and he said to Daniel, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. But then he says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. So that, that's in reference to a demon. This demon withstood me 21 days, but Michael, who we, right, he's the archangel, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings, more than one, of Persia. And came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for the days yet to come. So they may, I mean, they're they're organized. They have rankings. And so they may have different jurisdictions. And so may the demonic host as well. Uh, Yeah. Well, he's not the only messenger. Yeah. All of the angels are messengers. That's their, their primary role, but they also do other things as we've seen. So the, the angel who was coming was lesser in rank, so Michael had to come and help out. Well, he's he's lesser than Michael. Not necessarily Gabriel. Yeah. And what that lesser like how much that means, don't know. So, but enough, I mean, you, you got these guys going at it for 21 days. That's a long time. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. A few misconceptions. The first one is that people become angels when they die. Okay. Well, angels are completely different beings. 
And people, they, they either go directly to punishment or to glory upon death. Hebrews 9.27, and just as it appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Okay, so there's no interlude of wandering the earth as a angel. Yeah. The other misconception is that there are angels that are like cherubs or like Cupid. Cherubs is C-H-E-R-B. C-H-R-U-B-S. And um, fat baby angels. Yeah. Okay. They, they, they have a pagan origin. It's okay. You know, if you, if you ladies think that they're cute, uh, it's fine. Okay. Um, they, they go way back to Roman and Greek mythology. Um, the most prominent being Cupid, who was the companion of Venus in regards to fertility, okay? Um, and they were later popularized in Christian art during the 1500s and 1600s, um, and then later in the Vic Victorian era, okay? So but they're not real, they're kind of like gremlins, right? They're not real. Or um, gnomes. <laughs> or smurfs. Okay. <laughs> okay. Another uh, misunderstanding, a big one, is that, that angels are a proper means to pray to God, to communicate to God. Um, there's a, there's a prayer there, the guardian, guardian angel prayer. Um, it's Catholic. Uh, nowhere in Scripture are we encouraged to pray to angels. As we, we mentioned before, Jesus is our only mediator. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And, you know, if you think about it, why would you pray to an angel when you have direct access to God? For one, we're not supposed to. Two, why? Yeah. Go right to Him. Okay. All right. Another misconception or misunderstanding is that angels should be worshipped or in this country, revered? Well, angels are not proper objects of worship. And we should realize that they're particularly sensitive about this issue because they witnessed Satan fall. Why? Because he desired to be worshipped like God. And so they're, they're a little sensitive about this, I'm sure. And we see this um, uh, in John's Revelation. Revelation 19. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. Like John's overcome by the majesty of this angel. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, so he, he wasted no time in saying, John, that's a bad idea. We're not, we're not doing that. You need to get up. We're just, I'm a fellow servant. That's a really cool painting, by the way. I think that one's Spanish. Okay. Um, some practical application in regards to angels. Okay. 
Um, they show the, the, the greatness of God's love and his plan for us. Um, the, the first word that you have a blank for is image. Although angels are majestic, they're powerful beings, they cannot boast of one thing, and that is being made in the image of God, which we are. <laughs> also, children is the next word. We, we have been given the privilege to have children. They have not. The third world, third, third world? Okay, the third word is salvation. You and I, we were blessed with the opportunity to repent of our sins and be saved. The angels that rebelled were not given that choice. They rebelled, they sinned, done. Okay? So. It's set. Not happening. Done. Yep. Okay. They, um, they also, the, the next word is perspective. They, when we remember angels, that reminds us that there's a very real unseen world and a spiritual battle raging around us. Right. And then lastly, in regards to angels, the word comfort. Why? It's encouraging to know that such holy, intelligent, powerful beings are our allies. They are our friends. They are on our side. Yeah? And that is good. The question, and I just want to make sure that everyone hears this. Angels are not supposed to be worshipped. Okay? No confusion there. Don't worship angels, okay? All right. Okay, so now we move on from our allies to our adversaries, Ooh. okay? The demonic host, okay? So our, our common enemy um, in the spiritual realm is the demonic host. They are the enemies of God. And therefore, they're the enemies of God's creation, and they are actively opposing God's plan of redemption. Their desire is to destroy God's most cherished possession, people. If they could overthrow God's rule and reign, they would. And Satan probably thinks he can. Okay? All right, what is their origin? Well, a few things we need to note. God is good. God cannot create evil. Everything that he created was good. So God did not create angels, I mean demons, yep, as bad, okay? So we have to piece together some scripture to figure out, okay, what happened? How do we have demons? Okay, well, they are, they're rebels. They were demons, were once angels that chose to rebel against God. And we begin our look at this by looking at one particular rebellious cherub. And he has a few names. One of his names is Satan. And that Hebrew word Satan means adversary. He has another name, which is Lucifer, which means the morning star. That comes from a prophecy of judgment given through Isaiah to the king of Babylon, okay? But we're going to look at two prophecies, one to the king of Babylon, one to the king of Tyre. 
And so judgment is being pronounced upon these kings, but there are things in these judgments that these kings did not fulfill. The person behind them that was influencing what they were doing, he fulfills those, and he is Satan, also called Lucifer. Okay, let's read the prophecy from Isaiah 14. It sh- I think it's in your notes there. Um, it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you were cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol to the far reaches of the pit. So you have this pronouncement upon a being that has fallen from heaven, that arose in its heart in pride, saying that it would make itself like God. Okay, that's in this prophecy of Isaiah. Then there's the prophecy in Ezekiel to the king of Tyre. But once again, things that the king of Tyre can't fulfill, but the being working behind the scenes, influencing the king of Tyre to do what he does, those things apply to him. It says, Son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, and crafted in gold were the settings, were your, your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you, you were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. So you have this this being that was perfect, was in the Garden of Eden, was in the presence of God, was blameless until unrighteousness was found in him. And if we connect the two together, that unrighteousness came initially in the form of saying, I will make myself like God. I want to be worshipped like God. And so, from what we read, Satan, who's also called Lucifer, was once an anointed cherub who was created to worship God. But he became corrupt in his pride, believing that in his wisdom and beauty, he should be worshipped as God, perhaps replace God. Okay? Now, Jesus revealed the authority of Satan as leader of the demonic host when he said that every... Everlasting fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels. So he has authority. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because because since they they once were angels, now they're demons, yep, but they're still angels in the sense of that's what they were originally created to be, okay? So, there was a rebellion. <clears throat> when Satan succumbed to his sin, it appears that one-third 
of that innumerable number of angels decided to follow Satan. And this resulted in their transformation from being holy, angelic beings, to being demonic and having Satan as their chief, as their leader. As it says in Revelation 12, 4, his tail, speaking of this dragon, swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Okay. Other names of, uh, for Satan are the, the devil. Um, that comes from the word, the Greek word diablos, which means it implies a separation, conveying the idea that, that the devil, he, he separates. Yep. And he desires to separate people from God. In the scripture, it's, it's used in the sense of being a slanderer, slandering people, God's people. And you know, many times when, when, when people mention Satan or the devil, this guy pops up. Okay, um, he doesn't look like that unless he wants to, okay? Um, particularly the, the red one, okay? That, that um, comes from uh, ancient beliefs. Um, and in the Middle Ages, uh, Satan was often portrayed like Pan, the Greek uh, god of hunters, and the leader of the satyrs. But you know, in the Middle Ages, they, they put on these plays um, for the people, and, uh, and it became common to dress the devil as a satyr that was red. And that's where we get our red devil today. It's not what he looks like, right? He, he can manifest himself in a variety of ways, he can make himself look really, really good. Yeah. He's compared to a dragon. And, you know, dragons are known for their great strength, their, their flaming, probably bad breath, uh, fury, and ability to fly, right? And all of those attributes metaphorically fit the character of Satan, Right? He has great strength. He has flaming bad breath. <laughs> yep. In the sense of what he does, he, he's furious and he, he's able to get from place to place quite quickly. Yep. He's also called a prince. He's called the prince of this world. It says in Ephesians 2 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so he's likened to the, being the, the prince of this world system. And because he's a prince, that means that he com has position. He has authority. Okay. He's also likened to being a, a god. Small g. He would like to be big g, but he's little g. Okay. Um, he is the God of this, of this age, this present world system. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he is actively at work behind the scenes trying to get people to, to fulfill what he wants. And he's trying to get the world to, to, to do uh, his bidding. And he can do that, but it's all under the control of God himself. What God permits, what he allows. Okay? All right. What are their character like or his character and what do they do? Um, when I'm a, a Bible teacher, I like to read. Um, his name's R. Kent Hughes. But anyway, he's talking about Satan's character. 
He says, Satan has no conscience, no compassion, no remorse, no morals. He feeds on pain and anguish and filth. And he, he takes no days off. There's no, there's no ceasefires. He only wishes to rob, steal, kill, destroy. That's, that's his deal. Okay. Um, and he has power. That's the next word on there. He's very powerful, but he's not all powerful. He, he is, he's a created being. You know, sometimes he's portrayed as being like the, the direct opposite of God. And that's not the case at all. He is a created being. He is powerful, but he does not have anything in regards to God. God is all powerful. Satan is limited in his power. Um, and we see there in Job um, that God, Satan needs permission to do what he does. <coughs> then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions, have increased his land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to his face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So he can only do what God allows him to do, nothing more. And um, that's a, a painting of, of, of Job's wife, um, who her encouraging words to Job were, curse God and die. Um, and then behind the scenes, Satan is at work. Yeah. Um, whispering in his in her ear and you know kind of trying to control the situation there. Let's read this from um, John Phillips' commentary. It says, "Principalities and powers, rulers of this world's darkness, wicked spirits in high places, fallen angels, demon bands, Satan himself are all circumvented, held in check by Christ." Whether they are overruling the affairs of nations or empires, disseminating satanic creeds, tormenting children, inciting men to war, spreading famine and woe, inciting people to lust, blinding youth with drugs or binding youth with drugs, blinding adults with delusions, hindering God's work or sowing tares among the wheat, they are curbed by the Lord." They gnash their teeth in rage, but they bow before the authority and power of one who says to them, thus far and no farther. So everything they do is limited. And God can override everything. Yeah? Satan is also the, the father of lies, sin, and murder. Jesus, when he was rebuking the Pharisees, he said, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. When we're tempted to lie, we're being tempted to emulate the devil. He's not who we want to emulate. Yeah? We want to stay away from, from following in his footsteps in any, any way. He's also the accuser. He accuses believers before God and he slanders God to people. He's our adversary. All of, you know, and, and it's not just, you know, Satan, it's all the demonic hosts. They are actively 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to oppose the purposes of God and the mission of God that we talked about last time. Peter exhorts us, be sober, 
Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And there's, there's multiple ways that they seek to oppose God's work in people's lives. They, blindness is one, spiritual blindness. They blind people from the truth of God's word. Then they lay traps and snares. They're continually trying to tempt people to sin and to disobey God. They resist, they seek to resist the prayers and the ministries of God's people. Remember when we read from Daniel, there was that resistance. 21 days that angel was trying to get to Daniel, but he was being resisted by the prince of Persia. They bring affliction. They afflict people with illness and disease. But I want to be very clear. Not all illness and disease is the direct result of being afflicted by demons. Sickness and disease also comes because we live in a sinful world. And it's just the impact of sin. Okay? But there are times where sickness and illness does come because demons are afflicting people. <clears throat> They also desire to possess people or oppress people. They desire to inhabit the physical bodies of people. And we see this many times in the New Testament. I've seen it in real life as well. (laughs) Um, Where they... Seek to possess people, to take up residence in a person. And I think you have this quote by Charles Ryrie, I think, there. He says, the characteristics of demon possession can be as varied as the activities of demons, ranging from mild to severe and even bizarre. Not too many specific symptoms of demon possession are described in the accounts, but they include the following. Physical abnormalities like muteness, blindness, and convulsions. Tendencies to self-destruction. Insanity. At least the people believed demons could produce this. Superhuman strength. And occult powers. Though demons can do these things in people, this does not mean that all illness, for example, comes from demon activity. I agree. That's what I just said. Thanks, Charles. Okay. He's in heaven. So he died in 2016, it says there. Um, So they seek to possess people. And so that leads us to talk about, okay, all right, can believers, can a born-again Christian be demon-possessed? Is it true that a born-again believer can be possessed? And I believe, no, they cannot. Um, Why? Okay, well, because we are now, that's the word you're missing, called the children of God and have been delivered from the power of darkness being brought into the kingdom of Jesus. Colossians 1.13 He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And then John, writing in 1 John 3, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. Okay. Okay. Since you and I are children of God, we are in Jesus, and Jesus is in us. This is Jesus teaching. He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. 
I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Okay? We are God's children now. We've been delivered from the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light. Jesus is in us. We are in him. And Jesus is greater than anything or anyone in the world. 1 John 4.4 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Okay? When we believed, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We now have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. 1 Corinthians 3.16. If Jesus is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Okay, well, darkness cannot dwell or live where light is. Therefore, an evil spirit cannot occupy the same dwelling as the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 6. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? None is the implication. And then, as I said before, that um, demonic activity is controlled. It's controlled. And since all demonic activity is kept in, it's kept in balance, Satan can't do anything without God allowing it, okay? He would not allow his children to be possessed, okay? So I believe that, that we're very safe to say that a born-again believer cannot be demon-possessed. But I would say this, is that Believers can be oppressed. They can be attacked by demons. Yeah? And they, they can, that can range to you know, a bad dream to serious effects. And, you know, some attacks come just because the believer is experiencing opposition from the enemy. Other attacks come because of maybe the believer has given into some sin that they shouldn't have given into, and they've given a, a foothold for the enemy to oppress them. Yeah? But there, that's, that's, there's a, a distinction. That's the enemy working from without. Yeah? The other would be the enemy working from within. Okay? How bad can it be? It can be bad. Yeah? And so we, just, we, we don't want to mess with the devil. <laughs> We want to keep keep away, okay? Right. He is an imposter, imposter. He's very good, very subtle at masquerading as an angel of light. He misuses scripture. He knows how to, to twist it. He inspires human imposters who can perform signs and wonders. 2 Corinthians 11. For such men are false apostles, deceitful working men, uh, workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Okay. What do they get to look forward to? Well, 
they have future judgment. And they, they're aware. They're aware of this. Matthew chapter 8, describing Jesus. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? They know that torment is coming. They're trying to do everything they can to prevent it, but at the same time they know that it's coming. So there's a future judgment. They're aware of that. How long is it? Well, it's everlasting. Revelation 20.10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. And is this a, a maybe? Is it a might happen? No, it is certain. Their judgment is promised in God's word. John 16, 11. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Jesus is saying that like it's already written. He is judged. It is done. His time is ticking. Okay? Wow, we made it through. That's amazing. Okay. So, um, some practical applications in regard to demons <laughs> and Satan. Well, they, they deserve our respect in the sense that we understand that they are, are powerful beings. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, we don't need to talk to them. We don't need to, you know, none of that stuff. We need to talk to God. And if we think that there are demons involved in something that's going on, we talk to God about that. We pray to him and say, you know, Jesus, you take care of these things. Yeah. Right. Um, authority is the next word. You and I in Christ, we have been given authority over his power and influence because we have been covered by the cleansing blood of Jesus. And so when he's tempting us, we don't have to listen to his temptations. We, when he's trying to condemn us, we don't have to listen to that. We, yeah. The next word is, is aware. We, we need to, to not be ignorant of Satan's devices, to be on guard for his temptations and his attacks, and putting on the whole armor of God that is described for us in Ephesians chapter 6 which has a lot to do with God's word and prayer. Okay. Then lastly, is to resist. We're to be diligent to not give any place to the devil in our lives where he might tempt us or condemn us. We are to submit ourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Yeah, he will flee. All right. So, looking at Satan, when he's when he's the same as you got to know that you are of the God. You are one of the one of those favorite angels. Yeah. But then, I don't know. For me, I'm, I always ask myself this question. I don't really think it was necessary for God to. Satan to go down the earth with all of these powers. And then I ask myself that question, and I say, Yeah, I go back to the question. Do I think it's necessary because if Satan doesn't come to tempt us and to convince us as Christian or as Christ followers, I don't think we'll be on the way for desolate. Because all these temptations, yeah, I believe that these temptations, these trials and tribulations, if Jesus Christ Himself can go through these things, we as we as his followers as children. I would say it's far more necessary for us to go through this thing as well. So many times I would ask myself, why Satan get all this power? Satan, everything is Satan power, a lot of power in there. He also has disciples in there. I'm like, why 
I really don't know. But I think it's necessary that people have this power because we all know like from Genesis all the John we have the push. We push, we push it. As he pushes us, we push more to God. Yeah, God God uses uses Satan as a tool. Yeah. He uses it as a, as a tool to um, work out God's purposes in the world. And then also as he, as he seeks to oppose us, in that as we resist him, we become stronger, right? So, so God uses him as a tool. And it, it must be, I'm sure it's very frustrating for him, because his goal, right, is to, is to destroy and so he's continually, God is continually turning things around on him because he'll, he'll do stuff. He'll be like, yeah, if I can get Jesus crucified, that's going to be the ticket. Yeah. Well, actually, the crucifixion brings his defeat. Yeah. And he does it, it, it's over and over again. As he, you know, it seems like he gains success. But the thing is, is if God has allowed it, then somehow there must be a good purpose in it. It doesn't mean that it's a good thing, but there's a good purpose in it or a good end to it. There's a lot of wicked things that happen in the world, and we're like, Ugh, like how, ugh, how could anything good come out of that? And a lot of things for us, I don't think we're going to understand it on this side. We just can't. But we have to trust and know that God, I mean, He knows all. Yeah, He is all wise, all knowing, and He's also love. And if He's allowed it to happen, even though it's, yeah, yeah, for some reason, in His wisdom and in His love, He's determined that that is the best thing that needs to happen. Not that He, um, you know, He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't make people do the bad things that they do. People do the bad things that they do, and Satan does the bad things that he does because they want to. Yeah? He just uh, is overseeing everything that's happening and making sure that everything is going to go to a good end for his glory and for the eternity of everyone that responds to his forgiveness. Yeah? Hard for us to get wrap our heads around, though, you know. Yeah, it's it it really is that it that's not the only mention of the punishment being unending. Yeah. So it 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 is terrible. Yeah, frightening. Yeah. So uh we would like to think like, oh, well, you know, after a couple seconds it's all done. <laughs> but Well, they, they have sinned against a holy, eternal God. And we, we are so limited in our understanding. And because we, um, you know, uh, our thinking has been shaped from sin, that we, just, we don't understand how great of an offense that really is. And, well, it's a pretty great offense because the punishment is a pretty great punishment. Well, he 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 is when people don't repent, and so he he's in complete control of that. He's he's determined that that that's the way that it would be. In his love, the scriptures tell us he doesn't desire that anyone would perish. He doesn't desire that anyone or anything, he doesn't really want Satan to be there, but that is the result of their rebellion and their 
sin. Yeah. He, like, and when, when we think about, you know, think about, like, the nicest person that you know, you know, the kindest person that you know, the most loving person that you know, they, they're like nothing in comparison to God, like how kind and merciful and loving He is, and yet, He is also, He's holy, and He's righteous, and He's just, and so He, he has determined that um, in who He is, who is, He is the perfection of all of those things. He is perfect love. He is perfect mercy. He's perfect grace. He's perfect righteousness, holiness, and justice. And they all are working together in one person who is God. And he is determined that that should be their fate because of what they have chosen to do. Yeah. Hey, let me say something. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. No, no. He's the one that gives us comfort. Even good sleep comes from God, right? And he is the living water, so we never go thirsty again. So remove all those attributes, right? Because he's decided that he's going to separate his, himself and his children away from iniquity. So all those things are taken away. So what are we left with if not just water and thirst and fullness? Because every single good thing comes from him, even his sleep, you know? So it's not... No, no, no. It's it's true. Like God is God is God is present in in hell, and what is what is present is His wrath and His justice and His holiness, and He has He's He's chosen to like not have any of His goodness there. It's a place where that is non-existent. Yeah. I, I have friends, good friends, that I believe are already there. <laughs> and that, that, that is frightening for me. And that's one reason why I do what I do. Because I don't want anyone else to go there. But I, I also, like I said before, I trust that God is good. And... And he is loving. And they, they are there because they, they chose to be there. They rejected God's goodness. And they didn't want him. And they got what they wanted, in a sense. Life without him. Yeah. So you, you were talking about uh, permission with uh, dreams. That the devil needs permission before he goes. Yeah, permission, yeah. Yeah, he, he has always. Yeah, he, he is he's under God's authority. He can't he can't do anything. So if we believe and humbly that devil may always seek permission from God. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how it works. I you know, you know, if he's if he's gonna ask every specific thing, or if it you know, it's just as a general sense that like he'll try to do stuff and God will be like, No, that sorry, that's not gonna work, you know. So I don't know how how it plays out in the actual but but yes, the reality is is that he can't he can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's under that authority. Hmm. 
Hmm? Approval. Oh, yeah. Approval. Okay. Yeah, good questions. Lots to think about. We made it. I don't know what we're going to do next week. That's okay. God does. Let's pray. Okay. Well, Lord, we, we thank you for our allies that are on our side. We thank you for uh, the ministering spirits, the angels that you have at work uh, moving your mission of redemption forward and that are at work, um, yeah, doing good things for your glory. And God, we recognize that we have an enemy, that his desire is just to steal and rob, destroy. And Lord, give us wisdom uh, in regards to his tactics, his ways. Lord, that we would know when he's at work, <clears throat> we would know his temptations, his traps, his snares, and that you would equip us to resist him to stand fast, and to move forward with you. And God, we, we've touched on the fact that, that there's people that we love that in the present are headed for a lost eternity. And so, Lord, we want to bring them before you, and we cry out to you, Lord, and ask that you would reveal yourself to them. Lord, that they would see you for who you are, that they would see Jesus as their Savior, that they would turn to you, Lord, and be set free from their sin and receive eternal life. We thank you. For your glory we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.